And of course, just one last note here, um, we really do ask that all questions uh, posted are respectful towards the discussion at hand, uh, the panelists and the other audience members here tonight. Uh, and just as a word of note, any hateful remarks will not be tolerated at all. So without further ado, I'm really looking forward to this informative uh, discussion we're about to have tonight. Uh, so perhaps I'll pass it off to each panelist to introduce themselves. And perhaps we could start here, uh, just in the order that I see the panelists on my Zoom. Uh, so potentially Dr. Nielsen, would you mind uh, going first? Thank you. Uh, my name is Hilding Nielsen. I am Mi'kmaq from the island of Tatumguk, or Newfoundland. I am a professor in the Department of Astronomy and Astrophysics at the University of Toronto, where I work on different problems in stellar and exoplanet astrophysics, as well as working towards uh, an indigenous approach to astrophysics in the ac academy. So I look forward to a great discussion. Thank you. Thanks, Dr. Nielsen. Uh, Dr. Dempsey, you're next on my list here. Everyone, I'm Jess Dempsey. Uh, I'm the outgoing deputy director of the James Clerk Maxwell Telescope, which is on Mauna Kea in Hawaii, um, where I spent uh, nearly 15 years uh, in various flavors of instrument science and astronomy. And I'll be the incoming director of Astron, which is ground based astronomy for the Netherlands, uh, starting in a couple of months. And I'm very glad to be here. Thank you so much, Dr. McLaren. Uh, hello, I'm uh, Bob McLaren. I actually retired uh, a year ago, but prior to that, I was for 31 years on the faculty of the Institute for Astronomy at the University of Hawaii. Uh, much of my time spent there was involved with the development and the operation of astronomy facilities in Hawaii, both on Mauna Kea and on Haleakala. Prior to that, I had a period at the Canada France Hawaii Telescope. And before that, I was actually on the faculty of the University of Toronto Department of Astronomy for about seven years. I got my education at U of T and originally from Southwestern Ontario. Thank you very much for inviting me to be part of this interesting panel. Thank you, Dr. McLaren. And to round us off here, Dr. Pete. All right, yeah, good, good day. I think it's day where you're at. Maybe it's evening, I'm not sure. Um, but I'm here at the University of British Columbia, where I'm an assistant professor of teaching in Earth, Ocean, and Atmospheric Sciences. I'm originally from Montana in the United States. Uh, my uh, tribal group is called the Bitterroot Salish. We're the easternmost band of Salish-speaking uh, folks. Um, and uh, my, um, my interest in astronomy stems from uh, the reconstruction of our own oral traditions and our stories that relate to the, uh, the stars and the, and the heavens above us and um, where I can find uh, nuggets of information that might uh, help and aid um, knowledge production in academic science. Thanks so much, Dr. Pete. And if you weren't here last night, again, my name is Stephanie Grondin, and I will be moderating this panel. I'm a second year PhD student at the University of Toronto, and yeah, very happy to be here. Great, so we might as well move into our first question of the night here, uh, which is centered around observational astronomy and education. Uh, so the question here is saying observational astronomy is a science that has been studied across civilizations and cultures around the world for thousands of years. Uh, however, in modern astronomy education, students are typically only introduced or familiarized with the work of astronomers of European descent and the subsequent methods that they developed. Uh, so the question here is how can astronomers and educators integrate diverse lesson plans and ways of understanding the night sky when teaching astronomy? And perhaps to start us off, um, given what you were just saying there, Dr. Pete, um, if you'd offer any insights to this. Sure, yeah, you know, um, the way that um, I was brought up in, in my, my country or my territory was, um, you know, all knowledge is respected equally. So to discard anything um, that might be practical or useful in a sense that is um, related to the aspirations of my community um, I, I mean, everything is uh, valued equally. So um, uh, the, the folks where I come from em embrace, um, I guess, the idea of modernism, but we also try to retain the values and traditions that um, have been held in our communities for, for uh, many generations. So the idea of really um, 
examining uh, structures such as um, that we have today and uh, that we call higher education, the university structure, um, the, the process of knowledge production can be a bit different than uh, what happens in communities. So um, given that and knowing that um, we live in a practical and modern world today, our, our youth, our, our young people need to get uh, an education, need to get skills to become employable in, in, the, in the vastness of, of, of earthly things. And so the, the skills that they might gain, um, of course, rely on understanding and knowing uh, modern tools. But I think the, um, the, one of the highlights of many young students going through uh, academic institutions is when their, um, their own culture or their own understandings from their community is um, represented in, in, that, uh, in, in that educational structure. But that can be very difficult because largely the, the representation of uh, of indigenous folks in the sciences is very, very, very low. So it puts the burden uh, on non-indigenous folks to try to navigate understanding what indigenous knowledge, indigenous astronomy, indigenous science is, and try to translate that into something that um, the young indigenous people understand. That's very, very, very difficult to do. Yeah, thank you for that. And perhaps Dr. Nielsen, given your background in uh, incorporating indigenous learnings into education, do you have anything um, you'd like to follow up with? Yeah, I think to try to build on Dr. Pete's response is to think about, we work in astronomy that's a system that's built historically in Europe. You know, I used to teach history of astronomy too. And, you know, it was a direct path from Aristotle through Europe to Einstein and today. And in doing so, we would even skip things like Islamic astronomies, which had a great impact on things like the model of our solar system and the observations that helped prove the Copernican model or Kepler's laws. We ignore, or we don't really talk about various Asian astronomies or astronomies from around the world. Now, it's not even just indigenous astronomies or indigenous North America. And that's a loss for all of us because when we do so, we are removing ourselves from, the, from our place on the land, from our communities, from understanding each other. And so one of the things that I find very important is to bring uh, indigenous North American astronomy into the classroom as much as I can, because being in Toronto or being anywhere else in this country, we have a duty to know where we are and whose land, and that's part of that. But it's also beneficial because in Mimagi out east, you know, we are, our elders tell us about too wide seeing. And this is the idea that if we have Western science as one lens and indigenous knowledge as the other lens, bringing them together means we can do more than having them apart. And so I think also being more inclusive of these knowledges is crucial to make us better scientists and better researchers. And that can be hard. I mean, there are so few indigenous people in STEM and in astronomy and in physics that you know, there are so few voices that can actually deliver or bring that knowledge with them into the classroom. And so we need to reach out to our communities and support the elders and the knowledge keepers. However, we can to share those knowledges as they see fit and to help us and to support the communities in, in, across this country in sharing these knowledges. Yeah, thank you to both of you. And I actually see there's a question here in the chat that's very closely related to what both of you were talking about. Um, reading, you know, what are some values of indigenous or not, not even just indigenous, but other sources of astronomy um, that we are really missing out with by only studying Western science? Uh, I guess a couple specific examples, either Dr. Pete or Dr. Nielsen, or perhaps uh, Dr. McLaren or Dempsey would like to chime in too. I would just, give one example um, <clears throat> of a way in which Hawaiian cosmology is now being um, revived and regenerated and intertwined in, in, uh, with uh, Western astronomy and Mauna Kea, which is the uh, Hawaiian offering of the Ahuaheia Noa program. Ahuaheia Noa means to call forth a name. Uh, naming in, in Hawaiian uh, culture is an incredibly important um, and, and very uh, weighty thing to do um, and is done with great respect. And this was an offering um, from a group of, of kupuna um, from Hawaii to name objects that have been discovered uh, and published uh, from Mauna Kea telescopes. 
And this program then um, will include uh, immersion school students uh, from the Native Hawaiian schools and their teachers to come in and in Hawaiian learn about the uh, nature of the objects that have been discovered. And then it will be those groups of students who name them and name them in Hawaiian. And those are the names are then given to the IAU to be the official names uh, of these objects. And if you are astronomers out there, I think you all know that astronomers shouldn't be allowed to name things. Uh, we do a terrible job of it. <laughs> and, and, and the second part is, it is a way then for the scientists to interact um, with the Hawaiian cosmology and the Hawaiian language, which is, you know, at the root of, of reviving and, and reinvigorating you know, the Hawaiian people and is in this revitalization movement now so important. And the example I was able to be involved with was, of course, the, um, the M87 image of a black hole from the Event Horizon Telescope. Uh, and we uh, actually had a um, very respected namer, um, Dr. Larry Kimura, offer the name Povehi, uh, which means uh, embellished, fathomless, dark creation. And it actually comes from the Kumulipo, uh, the Hawaiian creation chant. And, and in doing so, in, in this particular name, you know, it, it described what we took six research papers to describe. And, and it was amazing uh, to do this. And it was really resonant in Hawaii um, and especially for the students who worked on it. Uh, and I think this is something which we are starting to do and, and lean on more often because it is such a powerful uh, way to start to bridge some of these gaps and, and to bring um, that native Hawaiian cosmology uh, into the Western cosmology world. Yeah, very interesting perspectives. Thank you, everyone. Um, are there any final thoughts on this? Um, would anyone else like to add anything? I think there are some general aspects we can talk that can be discussed. For you know, there's no one indigenous methodology to science or learning, but you know, many scholars like Greg Kahete, Daniel Lipay, and others kind of explored how indigenous knowledges kind of operate as a methodology, like how we people would learn. And there's different senses. Like in the, in Western science, we tend to be have to rely on objectivity. Like we're separated from our experiment. Whereas if for many indigenous knowledges, we have to talk. We, we talk about how we're in relation with our observations. That and the, so there are two different things operating in that in that situation. And that can help us learn about things like um, the Drake equation or how climate change and how the Earth. Op in terms of our solar system and things like that, because we have to think about things, how we're related within our observations, not just as objective learners or objective observers. And so there are two different, in some respects, they can operate very complementary, for instance. I'd like to uh, re-emphasize a, a point that uh, Shandon made earlier, based on my own experience teaching uh, I taught a lab course, introductory astronomy lab course. And one of the exercises we did was to simulate um, voyaging from Tahiti up to Hawaii using the methods that we believe the indigenous people used as best we understand them. So we used the, the Stellarium uh, computer program and showed the changing position of the stars and so on as you move north from Tahiti up to Hawaii. And of course, at the time, this is some of you, I thought of this indigenous astronomy. But I now realize that what that really does is it. It shows the, a Western appreciation for astronomy. It doesn't have anything of the cultural aspect of it that Shandon was referring to. And um, I think though, to, to incorporate that, you need someone who ideally, uh, a member of the indigenous community doing the instruction. And that of course gets into the whole area of diversity, which is uh, an important end in itself. So that's actually the best way to address that aspect of it. But uh, second best, as Shandon suggested, would be to try to have instructors um, uh, at least a bit knowledgeable about how to express the, the cultural aspect in addition to the purely technical. And that I think you'd need to work 
oh. to do it well and reasonably proper. It also do well for, um, I think, in general, improving the, the knowledge of the non-Indigenous instructors. Yeah, thanks, Dr. McLaren. I think your mic broke up a little bit halfway through there, but um, I think we caught we caught most of that. Um, great. So thank you for that uh, for those great perspectives, everyone. Um, we'll probably move on to the second question, just for the sake of time. So we have lots of time for the audience to discuss um, as well. Um, but the second question here is now more centered on uh, telescope construction and science projects. Uh, and the location sites that you choose uh, when you go about designing these projects. Um, so the question here is saying, uh, if constructed, the 30 meter telescope would be the largest visible light among the largest visible light telescopes in the Northern hemisphere. Uh, this type of observatory would allow for better observations of deep space objects from the surface of earth. Uh, these sensitive instruments require clear skies, high altitudes and dry air for the best observations. So often mountains are the optimal location uh, for these facilities. Uh, however, many mountains have also been and continue to be places of cultural significance by different people around the world for um, many, many millennia. Um, and the planned development of the 30 meter telescope on the Hawaiian mountain of Mauna Kea is definitely no exception to this, uh, with the site facing backlash from the local indigenous communities uh, due to the telescope's planned construction on sacred land. So the question here is, in light of these legitimate concerns, how do astronomers go about planning observational projects in a way that both maximizes the science usage of the instruments and maintains respect for the land, the local communities, and the culture and history of the locations? Uh, so perhaps to start us off um, this time, uh, Dr. McLaren, I know that you uh, have a history at the Hawaiian, uh, many of the Hawaiian observatories, if you could offer maybe uh, your perspective on the history there. Okay, could you hear me okay now? I know there's a... Yes, working. I think okay. so. Yeah, if it becomes a problem, I can log out and come back in, try something different. I gotta give a very short answer first and then let others weigh in uh, on the question. Um, as you may know, the beginning uh, stage of looking for a location is, is called a site survey and Currently, or you know, traditionally, site surveys have have focused almost entirely on the the physical attributes of the site, right? And if you decide on your priorities or your first choice, and then you you deal with the the other address the other local issues. I think that uh, in short form, the way to address that is that at the same time you're doing the physical part of the site survey should be doing your exploration of the community situation, learning as much as you can about the, the population, if it's an indigenous community, what their views are, making contacts and having dialogue uh, with them as part of, from the very, very beginning. I think that's partly how we got into trouble in Hawaii and other places is that this really, really important interaction with the non-technical aspects of it didn't get started until, well, sometimes never got started, but in any event, got started way too late. Right. And Dr. Dempsey, perhaps with your experience with observatories around the world, um, could you offer any insights into this question as well? Sure. I mean, I think, you know, Bob has experienced you know, the Hawaii um, uh, situation over 40, 50 years. I was very intensely involved, uh, of course, in the last several years um, in, in Hawaii uh, as a spokesperson for the observatories during the protests. And so I'm very keenly aware that, you know, this is something that we, um, you can't undo what has been done. Um, and in Hawaii, we have a lot of rifts to heal and we have a lot of lessons to learn. And as we go forward with future observatories and examples of Event Horizon Telescope, now we're looking for new sites. And all of the sites you naturally want to go to are on mountains. 
mountains are all natural places um, where your local communities also know that these are important and special in a whole host of different cultural and spiritual ways. And so I'm now focused as much as I am on Hawaii and, and rebuilding and regenerating uh, our communities and redressing the imbalances and the inequities, which are the source of, of a lot of these rifts. How do we not do this again? Right? How do we build a telescope somewhere where it is asked for, where the community is not just involved or informed, but deeply intertwined with how we go forward with a project? Do we do this with indigenous methodologies? Do we make sure that this community is fully in, not just not just in agreement, but understanding what this context is and making sure that the returns to the community are beyond anything we've done before in terms of we can't just throw a little bit of outreach out there to the students and tick that box and say, well, we've done our part. That's not enough anymore. And so that's sort of where I'm focused on is how do we do that? Because I don't think we've tried that properly in astronomy yet. Um, you know, I'm searching for examples, and I'm really interested in talking to Pete here about this, of where are we seeing successful Indigenous methodology projects in other aspects? Because, you know, we need to find these and we need to adapt them in astronomy if we want to build even a single future telescope anywhere. And even perhaps outside of astronomy, like I know, Dr. Pete, you do a lot of uh, geology and hydrogeology. Perhaps this isn't just an issue with constructing telescopes, but other uh, science experiments as well. Is there are there any key differences there? Is it mostly the same um, or similar solutions to this problem? Yeah, this is um, this is kind of a, a tricky um, uh, subject because there's um, there's some variance in the response related to um, relationship with land in uh, indigenous communities for um, for the most part uh, in some traditional indigenous folks understand that um, you know land ownership is, is not something that um, is possible in a traditional sense that we, we can't own the land in a way you know um, so if you fast forward back you know a thousand years there was always a, a some sort of um, a relationship or process where you um, where you shared land, and if you had overlapping resources that you needed, there was some sort of protocol to uh, either it was war or it was not war, <laughs> in, in a sense for for that resource. But you never did put up a wall. There was never walls built or um, uh, fences built or or you know something that demarked an area as as like this is my land. So in the in the the recent movement, the, the land back movement, where um, indigenous uh, uh, activism is asking for the return of land to people, it's kind of an odd concept to some of the older folks in my community that that say, well, we we, we don't really we can't own land in that in that same manner as um, is this, is prescribed in some legal traditions, but our sovereignty is founded in. The, uh, an odd legal tradition through treaties and, and other agreements made between um, other governments. So we have to kind of fight for our sovereignty in an odd legal system that is not of our own, which we're oftentimes maybe not prepared for or don't understand as well, or there's just, there's just this paradigm mismatch when it comes to um, that legal tradition. So, um, you know, if you go back to, um, if I go back to my advisors and my advisors, advisors, there's always this, this idea and notion of sharing resources, because we, in the end, humans want to get along, get along with other humans, because we don't want to die and kill each other off. That's, that's the common thread among everything. So it was better to share when we could. And if we couldn't, well, then there had to be some sort of um, uh, disagreement. And sometimes those were handled in, in outright war, sometimes they were handled in other ways. So that's kind of the, the tricky the tricky business of being indigenous and talking about land, land ownership, land stewardship, anything in that area. Yeah, that's really, that's really interesting, Dr. Pete. And perhaps to even build off that, um, someone in the chat here is saying, you know, how do we decide on who owns the land and what are the rights of the land? Uh, so potentially, Dr. Nielsen, could you comment on this question here? I think that is a great question. And, and I agree, for most Indigenous nations, it's not about ownership of the land. It's about rights, it's about sovereignty and relationships with the land. When we talk about mountains being sacred, we're not talking about religious icons. We're talking about 
a natural place with its own spirit, its own rights, its own ecosystems. And when we're talking about sovereignty and land rights, in terms of whether it's Hawaii or Wet'suwet'en or Standing Rock, it's not it's not about ownership; it's about protecting the land. And you know, when we talk about having these telescopes, you know, when you know Bob would know this better than I would, but you know, when we want to build a telescope in Mauna Kea, there's an environmental review that goes through some governmental agency. And that aspect, the impact, but that doesn't necessarily use indigenous methods. That doesn't ask whether the insects or the plants that are are equals in many for many indigenous cultures, what their rights are. And and I think if I bring it back to the original question a bit, I am not really worried about how we apply indigenous methods because every nation or every community has its own methodology, and they'll tell us what to do. I think it's where do we start as partners. Where do we start with acknowledging our history of colonization? One of the issues with the 30 meter telescope is not the 30 meter telescope, it's the century, the set, almost a century of history of astronomy on Mauna Kea that has not done a very good job. And you know that's part of that issue as well. And finally, I think really it's not about sacred, it's not about supporting, it's simply about consent. What is consent? You know, do indigenous nations have a right to to consent to share? And that's a part of the land rights and part of the responsibilities of the indigenous nations with respect to the land. To protect the land what involves whether or not we give consent. And so in that respect, we should just assume that if we don't have consent, we should remove ourselves from the discussion. We should not put a telescope on the mountain because indigenous rights, I'm sorry, Trump, our desires to have a really big telescope. And I really would like to have the 30 meter telescope because it's awesome, but not not against the wishes of many Hawaiians, not all, but many. So we should be, I think it's less a focus about how we get a telescope and more about how we partner with communities to support things like consent, to support things like language, to support in the discussions of their of indigenous cosmologies or indigenous research leadership. And we do see there are examples in the greater science uh, in biology and in gen genomics. There's the SINGS program, which is operated around the world by indigenous scientists and th that train indigenous, more indigenous scientists and is one of the most successful programs in Canada, the US, and I think maybe Australia. I'm not an expert on it, but we have a lot we can do here. But I think we need to step back and stop worrying about how we please people or how we convince people for our telescopes and just listen to what they want and what they're telling us using their methodologies and and just accept whether or not we have consent and if if we don't have consent we should just we should not build the telescope on that land any more than if we fail an environmental review or the state says no or whatever thanks dr nielsen um, and I guess a lot of this too is some astronomers, um, not all, but some um, really want these telescopes to go forward, perhaps regardless of the considerations. Um, and a question someone's asking here too is directed to either Dr. Dempsey or Dr. McLaren. Um, they're saying, you know, what are some of the difficulties from the astronomer's side with all of these protests in Hawaii, and I guess extending to other um, possible construction sites, um, if either of you could comment on that. I mean, I, I will let Bob too, because Bob was in the thick of this um, for many more years than I was, but um, personally, because I ended up essentially being a counsellor for a lot of astronomers who had an existential crisis and, and they had lived on the in Big Island for many years, you know, and suddenly they would, you not you don't go into astronomy thinking you're going to be a bad guy. <laughs> um, you don't really think of the ethical implications of astronomy very often. You're certainly not taught it in uh, undergrad. Uh, it's not it's not sort of you don't think it's going to be you know animal testing or crazy you know these things and yet so here was this ethical conundrum and what it really highlighted um, for a lot of people was their privilege and we talked about that a lot it's like well you're getting to you've gotten to this age in your life without having to think about these issues and now you have to right so let's go and stay back and start again and so there was a lot of real you know real soul searching uh, happening from a lot of people which was really important and especially for people who lived there decades and not have to address these issues which I you know now think of as an extraordinary thing 
that we, we haven't done this. And these were issues that were in front of our face on our island in a tiny community. So these were conversations that needed to happen and they were painful and really important. And particularly, I would say for this current generation of astronomers uh, and not just astronomers, engineers, technicians, the people who live and work in the observatories, they recognize we can't go on how we did and we shouldn't, right? We need to do a paradigm shift in how we work and interact and involve and communicate with our community. So it was painful, but it was important. Bob? Yeah. Um, astronomy on Mauna Kea is about a little over 50 years old. And um, I think it's important in this context to understand a little bit about the history of the interaction with the, the local community. The, the kind of discussions we're having now about the, the cultural importance and the, well, the consent aspect, the, all of that, that aspect is a fairly recent development, at least as far as it was articulated, you know, widely. In fact, it, it, it postdates the installation of all the telescopes that are there now. And to give you some examples of what I mean, um, when the telescopes of the 1980s and the 1990s were started, the groundbreakings and the dedications, we had what we considered at least prominent, you know, members of the local Native Hawaiian community participating in the in the ceremonies we had uh, faculty members from the um, University of Hawaii Hilo uh, Hawaiian studies program doing all the oles and this kind of thing and so at least from our perspective granted not a particularly well-informed one when looking back but it looked like there was some form of consent right you, you can say, well, you should have known better, or you weren't asking the right questions. And that's fair, that's fair. But I think there are some extenuating circumstances that help understand a little bit how we got to where we are now. But you may say none of that matters. It was a, you know, um, but at least it, it, it explained a little bit about sort of the, the surprise and I mean, you can say, well, now is now and then is then. Yeah, but back then, it's not as if, it's not as if the current facilities were built over the type and, and uh, severity of objection that we're hearing now. And for what exactly why that is, is that's a really, you know, People have written PhD theses trying to explain that. Um, but certainly from the perspective that we had back in, when I came to the University of Hawaii, the issues that we were concerned with were, were things like the, you know, the, the vacuum bug and the preservation of the shrines. Most of the cultural historical stuff was emphasis on the physical things, the shrines, not, not at all on the, on the spiritual and the cultural connections. That came, that didn't really come to the surface until around the year, well, 2000 or so, after everything that's there now was there. And you can say it sounds like an excuse or you should have known better or somebody should have known better or somebody should have grabbed you by the ear and shaken your head. And, and, and maybe if you look back, maybe some people did, but and you'll, I've asked friends in the Native Hawaiian community, you know, why is this? You know, and you'll get a variety of responses um, that what well, they were saying, we didn't hear them. They weren't talking to the right people, um, or that they were preoccupied with with other concerns. So I'm not saying that that is is 
really helps a lot with the current situation, other than extending, understanding a little bit better how we got to where we are. And that may help a little bit in figuring out how we deal with going forward. Thank you, Dr. McLaren, for that history. That was, yeah, very, very interesting to hear about that. Um, and perhaps I see Dr. Pete, you're typing an answer here, but perhaps um, for this question in the chat, um, it actually goes right off of Dr. McLaren's point here, you know, with this history, you know, how do we learn from this and how do we start conversations for consent um, or input from local communities, not maybe just in astronomy, but across all fields of science, um, especially, you know, with recent protests, do you think it'll be more difficult to hold these types of conversations in the future or what can we do to improve? Yeah, that's a really difficult one. It it um, it calls for the astronomer or the researcher really to be in tune with the community, changes in the community's needs, and that's that's a whole other skill set that you know um, we not we may not come in with as a, as a trained geologist or scientist or hydrologist, and coming from a different community, we, we might not understand the the difference in generational needs. I think um, importantly, the things that the things that I've seen uh, in the in the generations that are that are coming behind me is is this uh, this real attachment to activism and and standing up for for rights that um, maybe um, my generation wouldn't be wouldn't hold so strongly to for for whatever reason, and and I think um, understanding that history and that that generational um, experience with that history I think is important. I know in in the area I come from, the generations uh, two two or three generations before me, there was a strong a strong push to to sell land and to sell resources to make money for economic reasons, and um, that was that was the primary motivation. It, it wasn't necessarily to um, retain resources to to augment some uh, lost cultural protocols or lost cultural ceremonies or, or anything related to culture. But now the, the youth are, are very strong and passionate about reviving those and, and returning those into, into the mainstream operation uh, in the community. So it, it goes in line with saying, okay, well, we've got this, in this example, this telescope, do we really need it? Does it help us in any way? And if it doesn't, if it's not practical, then yeah, that's, we want it out of here because it's not doing anything for us. So I think the challenge is for uh, researchers, young researchers, old researchers in any field is really to, to get to know the pulse of the community, um, make your discipline practical to, to the folks that it really matters to, and, and in this case, where your instruments are located, and not just jobs, not just outreach, but really find ways to, to, to make it um, uh, seem like an, an exciting endeavor and, and, you know, making, marriaging Indigenous knowledge with them. Um, with academic knowledge, I think is is a, a great way to go. But that's really, really a challenge. It's really a challenge because a lot of knowledge has been lost in indigenous communities. But if this can be a catapult to refiguring out those or revealing those, I think that's important. And that's what really excites me about astronomy right now is just revealing some things that are in these oral traditions that modern astronomy can help us reveal. Totally. And Dr. Nielsen, just wondering if you'd like to follow up on any of these points that have been made here recently. Yeah, I think there's a lot. Um, there are questions about what is consent and how we just have that conversation. I think it's a very challenging one. You know, we don't get to decide what consent is. A community has to decide that however they choose, whether it is through their tradition, through traditional elders, through a blind vote, through whatever. Our goal, I think from the astronomy side, what we do in terms of consent is support communities and to prevent things like violence against communities. One of the things that I think really changed my place in academia was the protest in 2019 when I saw that the Kapuna, that the elders were being arrested. Uh, friends of mine who are Hawaiian were on that mountain and were threatened with sound cannons, with the National Guard, you know, and as one of the Kapuna put it, they were threatened with the National Guard because there were too many natives in one spot. And so we have to be very clear. When we, we cannot achieve consent through violence, cannot achieve consent through just saying, this is how you, have, you give us consent. We can only achieve cons consent through the wishes of the community. And I don't have, a, there's no good answer to what that means. 
So having that conversation with communities can be very difficult. I think in Hawaii, it may not be possible anymore. I'm not sure if I'm honest. There's just, a, there's a diversity of opinion across uh, across the board in, 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 for Native Hawaiians. And there's a long history that we have to come to terms with. You know, as Bob mentioned, you know, astronomers didn't really know these things or know these things were happening. And no, I don't think anyone really did because, you know, astronomers were people and society, you know, 20 years ago, 30 years ago was very colonizing everywhere. And it still is today. You know, we, today we have the, some of the tools with the United Nations declarations for the rights of indigenous peoples. We have tools of consent, free and prior informed consent that can't, uh, First Nations in Canada have been developing. And as a, as a field, I think we need to embrace these as tools for going forward and to listen to these communities. And that includes listening to indigenous knowledges and bringing them forward at every age. You know, uh, in, you know, in Mi'kma'ki, the ch you know, children can be taught anywhere from from when they're walking to grown up, because you know, it's all land based knowledge. It's understanding the water, medicine, the land, and, and having a chance and the ability to explore that. So I think bringing that indigenous knowledge and education should happen at every level. Uh, you know, from K to whenever your last degree is, and we can do that. But, but I think if we ever want to, if we want to have a system with consent, we need to start from scratch and try to work on our reconciliation with communities we have harmed, whether it is in Hawaii or in Southern United States or in Chile or in Canada, because uh, we build telescopes in Canada and historically, and we may want to build telescopes in Northern Canada or elsewhere in the future. And so we need to start from the beginning to have these conversations of consent and partnership. Um, you know, it's, it's not, we, I don't think if, if we want to be equitable partners, we don't go in and say, we'll give you so much dollars to rent some of the land here. How we'll go and say, how do we share? How do we learn from each other? How do we share these resources and share? How do we both benefit from the, this great access to the sky with telescopes in ways that we never have before? And, if astronomy is supposedly for everyone, then indigenous peoples and indigenous communities will have their own desires and wants for these telescopes. And if not, we, we it's our job to respect that. Thanks, Dr. Nielsen. And Dr. Dempsey, I'm also interested in your take on this, given your experience working with um, youth and trying to get them involved in science. How do you incorporate, you know, right from uh, the start, um, you know, different ways of learning, whether it be in Indigenous learning or just different uh, multicultural learning in your teachings? Yeah, I mean, I think this is the other thing, which is that we've got such a Western way of doing curricula. And you can't just translate a, this curricula into an indigenous language and say, yeah, here we've made it an indigenous educational system, right? I mean, you have to un deconstruct the whole thing and start from scratch with the relevant context and the relevant indigenous knowledge, which means, of course, having, an, and, and Pete has already mentioned this, the problem being there's only, if you put all the burden on the few indigenous people who are already astronomers or already geologists, you know, that's what you're gonna spend your entire time doing. So generating another pool of young indigenous physicists, astronomers, geologists is, you know, of course the first thing to do. And then you fold them into creating a curriculum which is far more adapted and relevant. We're doing this now with um, uh, young girls and uh, Native Hawaiian girls in, in Big Island of Hawaii and working with some of them to mentor them with the older um, Native Hawaiian girls who are already in the programs in, the, in university. And we're doing this as we go, figuring out how do you create a curriculum which is relevant to these girls and their experience rather than trying to shoehorn for them into a Western culture, because that's how you make them feel seen. That's how they know this is something that within the context is worth, you know, is, is worth their time and we are committed to. And it's a lot of work. And, and I would say, especially to Pete, you know, we haven't figured it out by any means, but we have to start somewhere. And, and you know, these girls are, are, in, are incredible. And, and seeing them, they're developing the curriculum, right? They're telling us what's relevant. And, and then they're folding it back in and adapting it for, for this next generation. And the, the idea is to not let them, you can't drop one extra indigenous student into 
uh, you know, the University of Honolulu Manoa and expect them to sink or swim um, because that's how we lose them. You know, it has to start with inclusivity and it has to start with us recognizing that our curriculums are culturally bereft of the kind of support of a community like we see um, on the Hawaiian Islands, for example. So, so these are things we're just starting on. And, and, you know, we can't let this fall on the shoulders just of the very few Indigenous people who are already within our structures, right? We have to learn this. So, I mean, I learn this on a daily basis and, and I now I can very badly speak to Native and Indigenous languages, but that's where you start, right? You have to start with saying, why doesn't every astronomer or technician who comes to work at a Mauna Kea Observatory, why is it not mandatory that you learn Hawaiian? So we're starting at that sort of expectation level. And so now, at my, you know, my observatory, we start with six months for every incoming person and that's mandatory and the rest of it then is optional and everyone is choosing to continue after that six months. So there's just little things that we're starting to do to shift the burden of how we adapt these things. Um, so they're just a couple of examples, but, you know, we need to find more. Thanks, Dr. Dempsey. And I guess we have five minutes left, but um, Dr. Pete, a question um, specifically perhaps for you is um, there are, uh, there's, we've heard a lot about the history of observational astronomy, um, but there are a lot of you know, young astronomers, early career astronomers um, that are starting out and who want to make you know, science, astronomy, um, you know, a more equitable, inclusive environment. And as an astronomer who is a settler, as a non-Indigenous person, you know, how can we, uh, what are some actions or initiatives that we can take um, incorporating into our careers and our learnings um, to, do, to do this, to make, you know, a better future for everyone and all peoples involved? That's a tough one. <laughs> That's a really, really tough question. I don't know the answer. I don't know the answer to that. But what I do know is, um, you know, to, to make something to make something interesting, you really have to tap into, um, you know, what what a current generation thinks is um, is worth their time. And even for me, as a you know a person, you know, pushing pushing almost fifty, I I have a hard time tapping into the the desires of the young Indigenous generation because I'm I'm a couple generations removed. I could I could. Um, you know, highlight any part of a cultural pursuit that I think would be important to bring back into the community. But if they're just not into it, then that, it's that's going to be a, a challenge. And I think all educators face that same challenge. So I don't think it's I don't think it's so vastly different what we're talking about than what any educator tries to do. And I think one of the bigger problems is is really that we're we're trying to teach. Um, these really active and hands-on type of, of, um, of disciplines inside the, the four walls of a classroom. And that's really an odd, odd way to learn something. And, you know, it, it's been working for a while, but I, I think um, we're starting to recognize that we need to take maybe a, a more applied approach. And I, I don't know if that's the right answer, but I know um, in a more active, engaged classroom, it requires, you know, challenging the, the status quo of instruction at uh, institutions. And I think most faculty, at least where I work, embrace that. And you, you don't see a whole lot of just straight lecturing. There's a lot of hands-on activity, a lot of getting outside of the classroom when they can. And I think that same approach um, also happens in communities. You see a big failure in uh, something like uh, language revitalization. So traditional language revitalization generally has been occurring in a classroom and, and, and largely it's been a failure for the most part in a lot of communities. But when they start taking that um, language instruction and, and putting it back into uh, um, a format that seems to work where it's an activity on the land, then that it, it seems to have a little more results. That's, I don't have evidence to prove that, but just to see uh, some of these activities, you, you, see it, you see it working and people really embracing because you're marriaging that idea of language learning with an activity that's also founded in the culture. And that's where the language lives, that's where it thrives. So finding where astronomy lives and thrives among the, the native paradigm is, is super important. And I, I haven't dove into it deep enough yet, but from my own traditions, I, I know the big questions that I have and that I want answered 
And I'm hoping to inspire some, some younger folks in this by um, them finding their own big questions. Thank you, Dr. Pete. Yeah, yeah, thank you so much. Um, potentially I'll pose the same question, um, perhaps uh, rounding this off with Dr. McLaren, then Dr. Nielsen, then Dr. Dempsey, you know, just perhaps general resources that you'd like to share or thoughts on, you know, how we can best go forward as an astronomical community, um, given uh, all three of you are astronomers. Perhaps Dr. McLaren, if you'd like to give some short thoughts on that. Well, just a couple random thoughts. And one, um, Dr. Pete was talking about ways of resolving differences or conflicts. And, and war is probably the worst, I would say. <laughs> but I, I know the second worst, and that's litigation. <laughs> it's, um, you don't, people don't get killed, uh, at least not physically. Um, <laughs> but um, the, uh, it absolutely removes any possibility of constructive dialogue because it's by de by design an adversarial process i mean you get a you get a result like you get in a war right uh, but it's not it's not necessarily a, a very satisfying result and part of the reason i mentioned i meant to mention it earlier that we have not made the kind of progress that we should have with in, Hong, in hawaii is that virtually the entire period from 2000 even up till now has been uh, consumed with one type of court of litigation or legalistic procedure and one after another um, and that is uh, definitely not pr uh, uh, productive for the kind of progress that you'd like to see so that's one thought that I'd like to leave people with at least don't try to stay out of court, <laughs> um, like it says in the Bible, right? Uh, the other thing is completely separate. Um, talking about potential possibility of, uh, of a, a further astronomy development on Mauna Kea, that and some kind of consent that you might envisage or might be possible. I think it's a big mistake to think of the TMT in isolation as, a, as separate from everything else. I think you need to focus first on, on whether, you know, and what version, if at all, uh, you're in favor of astronomy, looking at both the pros and the cons in general, something about the overall scope, and then think about what particular components fit into that sort of a top-down approach to your thinking of what's the best thing to do and not a bottom-up approach which focuses on particular facilities uh, at the beginning. Thanks Dr. McLaren. Uh, we might be a few minutes over time here but if that's okay with all the panelists I'd love to just get a kind of a closing remarks or uh, thoughts by Dr. Nielsen and Dr. Dempsey before we leave today. Thank you. I think I, uh, I hesitate to do this, but I, I feel I should push back and get to Bob's point a little bit. In Canada and parts of the US, Indigenous nations undergo litigation a lot against the state. And that's largely because their voice is ignored. The power imbalance between the state and the people is too much. And litigation in the court cases are sometimes the only way to get heard or to, or to, to establish rights, which has happened across Canada. In Nova Scotia, with fishing in Mimagi, uh, Wet'suwet'en has been a problem for this, Standing Rock sometimes. And I think we need to realize that historically our dialogues have not been equal partners. And we need to find ways to create that equal partnership, to have trust, to have equitable dialogue and to work move forward. And I think in terms of the resources for students in Canadian astronomy, the Canadian Astronomical Society, which is our professional society, has underwent its uh, big 10 year plan of what we want to do in the next 10 years. And a huge part of that is coming up with ways to have consent or to how we would broach consent in the future and, and ongoing, how we will work with Indigenous engagement, how we'll work in communities across Canada, in the North, in rural, in reserve, to create a space for Indigenous peoples in our field. Because right now, 
in Canada, in Canadian astronomy, there's like two indigenous astronomers, including myself. And at physics, you might get five or six. And we're not, that's a huge, a huge part of the problem right now is why wouldn't any indigenous person want to go into physics and astronomy in Canada when you can't, you don't see, we don't see ourselves reflected in our teaching in the classroom. We don't see ourselves in the knowledge and we don't see our communities or our elders. And I think that is a huge thing we, we need to not overcome, but learn to, to change because we'll only ever have an equitable society in Canada when you know, indigenous people are everywhere and indigenous knowledge is everywhere. And we work to support the communities in this country, which is the goal of reconciliation in the long term. And so things are happening, albeit glacially slow, but you know, hopefully maybe next year we'll have better news. Uh, so thank you. Thanks, Dr. Nielsen. And Dr. Dempsey, the floor is yours for some final thoughts. Thank you. Um, so <clears throat> I'm into young astronomers, particularly out there. I ask them when they're sort of tortured about this. It's like, that's OK. You know, you're, it's OK to be feeling conflicted about this. And in fact, that's really important. Don't be afraid of having difficult conversations. We're not used to them anymore. We're not used to going into them with an open mind and not defensively. Um, and astronomy is not an ivory tower science anymore. That's fantastic. It's going to be messy, it's going to be human, and it's going to involve commitments to our community that didn't exist before. That's brilliant, right? So I always ask people, don't walk away from those conversations. Don't get defensive. Be willing to get in the mix. What are you prepared to do? And, and that's the question I ask everyone, you know, going forward, which is to be willing to be in the mix, to be willing to, and yeah, maybe cross a picket line or two, right? Find out where you stand and what you believe in. And when you build those relationships, that's when we're gonna make the magic. That's where we're gonna problem solve this together and find a new paradigm. But it can't be like the old one, it's not going to be. And there are enough people out there saying, we're not gonna let it happen anymore, but let's not just stop creating. And let's not just stop and walk away either, because that's the classic colonialist knee jerk reaction. Let's figure out how to do this together. And yeah, it's gonna be tricky and messy, and probably kind of awesome. So, you know, for me, I have a lot of hope, um, but it also means a lot of work. Um, and, and that's actually, you know, something I'm actually looking forward to. Thanks, Dr. Dempsey. I think that's a perfect way to end the talk. Um, oh, briefly, I saw Dr. Pete, you posted a resource in here uh, into the chat. Do you really quickly want to plug this resource before we head out today? Um, oddly, I just seen it come across my, my LinkedIn newsfeed. I, it's a new book coming out. I have know nothing about it. I just seen it and I thought it was kind of neat. I think oh. my phone is spying on me. <laughs> it's listening Our, to you. I've already pre-ordered for myself and it is about uh, the first astronomers in Australia. But if, if you want something that's a little more Canadian or re relative to Canada, uh, I would look up the, uh, the Cree astronomer Wilfred Bach, who tells um, the, the greatest stories about Cree astronomy and his way he tells the stories are essentially medicine for us all. Thanks, I think the ASX would love to put these resources on their website too. So um, if you're in the audience or watching this later on on YouTube, you can definitely uh, check those out after. But thank you so much. Sorry, we're a bit over time here. Um, but again, thank you to Dr. Pete, Dr. Nielsen, Dr. McLaren and Dr. Dempsey for a really informative and useful discussion and necessary discussion. Um, and hopefully by having these discussions and continuing um, talks like these, we can uh, make astronomy a more equitable place uh, for everyone in the future. So thank you again to all of our panelists. We really appreciate you being here today and giving us your expertise. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Well, Thank you. Aloha.